This retrospect has been pretty interesting when exploring the evolution of the series. The Digital Devil Story games had the basic gameplay elements of Mega Ten, the classic mainline games were refined them further to a new extent, and then Nocturne comes and just reinvents the battle system, giving us fresh new gameplay that was really solid. Of course, the stories have been hit or miss, but were largely good. And if there's one game that seems to be what many consider to be one of the best Mega Ten games, it will have to be Shin Megami Tensei Strange Journey. Released in the US in 2010, Strange Journey is pretty interesting for a lot of reasons. The game will start a trend for the next few Mega Ten games to be released on Nintendo handhelds, which was a first and something that can still be felt today. And fun fact, did you guys know that Strange Journey could have been made on the PSP? And yeah, now I'm dead serious. If you want to know more about that, check this video right here. But to paraphrase what Konica said, the dual screen layout of the DS made looking at progression easier, especially when looking at your map. And you know what? Thank God it released on the DS because I can only imagine that playing Strange Journey on the PS SP with one screen was probably going to be very annoying. Another thing about this game is the feeling of finality that it has, as this game will mark the last time Kazuma Kanako would actively work on the series. This is also the case for a lot of the older devs, as between the release of Nocturne and this game, or actually really starting around the late 90s, a lot of the original people behind the series will leave the company to pursue their own projects. And if, emphasis on if, this were to be the last Mega Ten game ever made, and Atlas were to just put this series in a dungeon somewhere. You know what? I can kind of see it because everything about this game is on a grander scale than usual. Everything from the stakes of the story to the shit we come across, the message that the story is trying to send, and of course, the damn music was is a straight up orchestra. It makes it feel like the developers were truly giving it their all. Plus, it was a return to form as this game brought back the first person dungeon crawling and they really, like really wanted to cater to hardcore RPG fans. Now beyond what critics thought about this game, if I had to make a quick TLDR of my feelings on it, yeah, this game blew me away. It also gave me further anxiety, creeped me the fuck out a couple times, and felt like I was playing the first SMT again, just on a bigger scale, but we'll get into that eventually. But man, did this take me a while to get to, and this script alone took me longer than usual, cause this game, yeah, this game is something, and I wanted to make sure I can get my thoughts out the best I can for this, so much so that I even wrote notes on my experience of this game, all culminating to 8 pages of surprise, anger, and fear. Oh boy. But let's get into that story, and like always, if you guys don't want to be spoiled, make sure to click the little timestamp right here, and let's embark on a strange, strange journey. You like what I did there, eh, eh, eh? It's the 21st century. The Earth has over 7 million people living on it, and every negative thing you can imagine is likely going on. War, famine, disease, crime, and pollution so bad, you get the point, right? Unknown to the population is a mysterious black hole forming in Antarctica that is growing day by day dubbed the Source Belt. The UN sends drones to the area only to discover a parallel of our world ranging from a war zone to a red light district to the epitome of capitalism in an area so polluted to the point that anything living there is likely six feet under. Being dissatisfied with what they learned, the UN comes up with a brilliant idea to form a joint alliance and send a group of the best men and women from across the world to the Source Belt and investigate it to see if there is a possible way of destroying it. We begin the game playing as a soldier station within the Red Sprite under the command of the group's leader, Commander Gore. During this, we also meet the highly intelligent and compassionate scientist named Zelenin and a sarcastic and skeptical mercenary named Jimenez. After the introduction, we began making the preparations to enter the Swords Belt when suddenly something detects all of the ships and we're forced to make an emergency landing, knocking everyone out on the ship. We then come across these three mysterious men who are fascinated by us and wants to see our potential going into this new world. Just as we wake up from the crash and try to get our bearings straight, we end up getting ambushed by mysterious enemies and get sent a mysterious program to our demonica that allows us to see them. 
We find out that the enemies were in fact demons, and the program we were sent is known as the Demon Summoning Program, which also allows us to recruit and even fuse them. During the exploration of Sector A, we end up getting a distress call from Geminez, who seems to be the only survivor of his ship. We rush to save him, only to encounter a demon that kills Commander Gore. After defeating the demon, Gore requests for us to continue carrying on the mission and to find out more about the source spell so we may find a way to deal with it. With Gore dead and having practically no leader besides an AI named Octor, yeah, uh, long story short, shit does not look good at all. We go to the rest of Sector A and come across the head honcho of the sector named Morax, who has a strong distaste for humans due to all the violence we've caused. After being him, we end up getting this weird thing called a Rosetta and learn that it can take us to different areas of the Swords Fell. Using this Rosetta, we travel to Sector B, which looks like the red light district from the pictures we saw in the beginning. And yeah, really for the first half of the game, we largely do the same shit, being to figure out what this sector is, finding the Rosetta, being the head honcho, and dipping to wherever else the Swords Fell takes us. But like in the past games, there are different events, which usually has minor events that eventually leads into the bigger ones. During our trek through Sector B, we find Zelenin, who was the only remaining survivor from her ship because everyone else has either been killed or is being experimented on by the head honcho of the sector, Mitra. God, that's fucked. With the help from Estima, an angel who is pretty much going to be helping us throughout the game, we manage to save Zelenin and during a further siege into Mitra's... Uh, Mansion? Cabaret? Uh, honestly, I don't even know what the fuck this is. Jimenez comes across a unique demon named Bugaboo, who quickly befriends him. And so, it begins. After killing Mitra, we get his Rosetta and head into Sector C. Our time here is pretty quick as we only have to deal with this big bitch who took one of our ships and damn near absorbed itself into it. After dealing with the fat bitch Horikos, we manage to make contact with the Joint Alliance group on Earth with the Graviton radio from the ship Horikos was a part of. And we later learn that shit has gotten serious, as the Swords Belt is still growing and demons are seeping their way into the Earth, making our mission more urgent than ever. We head into Sector D, where the moment we step foot onto it, everything starts going downhill. Motherfuckers killing each other, and to make matters worse, Commander Gore's body is fucking gone. Yeah, Sector D is... Something to say the least, but we managed to save some of our crewmates after going back into Sector B for the cure, and we also come across Gore, who is now in a suit? So, okay, one, where exactly did he get a suit from? Actually, you know what? Better question. How the fuck did he get a suit in here, especially in a hellhole like this? And trust me, I know it's not an important question to ask, there's a bunch of other stuff we need to be really asking. But I don't know, man. This shit still has me baffled. Ah, oh, Jesus Christ. Uh, okay, uh, sorry. Let's get back on topic. Other than the shit we just experienced, we find the head honcho of this sector, Asura, take his Rosetta and dip to the quote-unquote final sector, which is a sanctuary compared to everywhere else. Within Sector E is the vanishing point, which theoretically means that the crew can escape from this hellhole. Before exploring the sector though, we call the Joint Alliance crew, who is planning on nuking the shit out of the Swords Fell after we escape. So, does that mean everything is all good? Can we finally escape? Yeah, uh... About that. The exploration of Sector E is cut short when not only is the path to the vanishing point blocked, but they also discover another group of people in the Swords Fell, all led by a man named Jack. Compared to us, Jack's crew isn't there for good reason, and only wants to collect Forma, a rare material that's being used to create our weapons and guns in the Source Fell. And all of this is in order to get rich and obtain power, cause, you know, cash rules everything around me. He offers to help us get into the vanishing point by doing a task for him, and after doing so, we manage to reach it only to come across a powerful demon called Ouroboros. And after our two-phase fight, and yes, two-faced fight with her, we go through the vanishing point only to get fucked up by a mysterious object. Our protagonist and everyone else ends up in front of the dream men from before who presumably stopped us from leaving for some reason or another. To make matters worse, we learn that the Joint Alliance group decided to nuke the Swords Bell anyways despite us not being able to escape, with the plan failing and leaving the crew feeling more tense than ever. We end up waking up in a new sector where, yeah, shit starts going south. While exploring Sector F, we learn that four demons from the past sector we've beaten have been resurrected and evolved to a new form for a rematch. 
To make matters worse, cause you know, shit keeps on getting worse for us, we find out that Jack's crew is doing some shady stuff and Gemini decides to stay behind and monitor them, only to later get captured. We raid Jack's HQ and discover Gemini and Bugaboo in a sort of cultivation chamber. In order to save them, we fuse the two together using the Demon Fusion program to create a half-human, half-demon hybrid of Jimenez, who is pissed and wants his revenge. We fight Jack with Jimenez later turning him into a fucking donut, and we head back to Sector F, where we kill the last few resurrected demons and fight Tiamat. She ends up leaving behind a formless mass, which takes us to Sector G, the last sector before shit gets even crazier, oh boy. And you know what? Let's make this quick, because there are two amazing things we come across during this sector. During the early bits of exploring Sector G, we find out that Jack's right hand man, Ryan, is planning on trying to fight us. While Gemini's wants to smoke, Zelda wants things to be peaceful for once, so how does he do it? By becoming a fucking angel courtesy of Estima. And fun fact, depending on your choices, you could just outright kill him. But yeah, no, in general though, she uses a hymn to put the last remaining members of Jack's crew in a weird ass hypnosis. After dealing with them, we come across a hallucination and we're later taken out of it thanks to the help of Commander Gore, who we find out was resurrected and was being controlled by Tiamat. But after the protag killed her, he's sort of back to normal, kind of? Okay, okay, so here's the thing. This man can now traverse the source felt like he's the Silver Surfer and wants us to fight Maya so we can go face to face with the big bad of this game, mem -El. We do so and dip to Sector H, the final sector. Before that though, we learn of the true intentions of these three mysterious men and what they want. Through Octor, they make an announcement to the ship persuading us to go down the path of law, where basically we'll have no free will and will serve God to pave the way for no conflicts, hurting, and everything will be all peasy and shit. Then, Luisa Ferra shows up, persuading the crew to follow the path of chaos so that we can be free and live in a world where only the strong prevails. And if you're wondering who Luisa Ferra is, you know exactly who he is. And what the fuck does he have to do with the story? Not much, because his relevancy is just him observing the crew. Fun. With all the choices laid out, Geminis and Zelenin goes out to follow the path of chaos and law respectfully, whereas we meet with Commander Gore, who escorts us to Mem Elf. From Sector F to here, we learn that she was the one responsible for creating the Source Veil after years of witnessing the atrocities that humans have committed onto the Earth. In a way, it's like karma, and because of all the shit that we did, she wants to reset the world to what she sees is right. Want to know what world Mem Elf wants to create? The world of chaos mentioned by Lucifer. Yeah. For now, we can't fight her yet, and Gore sends us back to the ship to decide on which side we should choose. We can of course choose either law or chaos, but there's of course the neutral alignment, where Gore believes that as humans we have infinite possibilities and the will to change what we do. Now, depending on the ending you choose, we'll have you fighting different bosses. If you go down the chaos route, you have to fight both Gore and Zelenin, with the latter being the final boss instead of Bim Elf. On the other hand, if you side with Law, you gotta fight Gore, Jimenez, and Memel. And if you're like me, who thought both sides were way too extreme, you end up going on the neutral route, which will have you fighting Zelenin, Jimenez, and Memel. And before you do all of this, you gotta find the Cosmic Eggs, which for my case, and once I join up with the neutral alignment, you basically gotta fight everyone just to get them. We get the Cosmic Eggs, defeat our comrades, and after our very hard fought battle with Bem Elf, the game ends with us using the Cosmic Eggs and a nuke to destroy the Swords Belt, allowing the last surviving members of the Red Sprite to escape, with them rushing to make contact with the Joy Alliance group to report their findings and what to do to avoid this from ever happening again. Meanwhile, if you choose Law or Chaos, they each create their respective worlds, with Zelenin creating a world where humans surrender their free will to God, and Jimenez creating a world where the demons of old and humans live in a world where only the strong survive. And whew, Jesus Christ, they did not hold back with this story at all. Compared to the older game, Strange Journey is a lot more clear about the themes that it's trying to focus on, and you really have to be one blind motherfucker not to see them. It focuses on a wider topic of environmentalism, the world capitalism has an effect in our world, the war that we constantly cause throughout our lifetime, and really, in general, it's just a message about our human nature, how fucked up it is, and whether or not we should have free will or not, because that's 
how both alignments are. And you know what, speaking of which, the alignments in this game are a lot more extreme and direct than the other games. Which, you know what, looking back on it is probably where a lot of people, including myself, initially got their idea of what alignments would be in Megaton. And you know what, let me go back real quick. Most of the other games were pretty chill with their alignments, and also very, or sometimes very or slightly ambiguous of what the ending would be for those. But nah, Drain's Journey made it so that you know exactly was going to happen at the end of the game. So when you choose your alignment, you really gotta think about it before you go and choose. For me, the neutral alignment sounded like the only sane choice because of how extreme both sides were. But the surprising thing is that I almost went onto the side of Chaos because of Gemini's. Cause very similar to an SFT2 where I almost went to the side of Law, yeah, the characters in here were really convincing about that. So let's talk about them real quick. Now, if I were to compile a list of the top 10 alignment reps that I've experienced throughout my retrospect, Geminis would easily be number three on that list. Now, in general, Geminis is a massive asshole, and early on can be kind of a pussy to an extent, but as the game continues on, he becomes the asshole with a point. But more importantly, we as the Protag actually build a relationship with Geminis, which was fun imagining the banter we can make with the choices we had. It also made the overall fight more painful when I was going through the neutral route, and a part of me was I would have just, you know, rocked with him a little further. Also, let's address the elephant in the room about Gemini's transformation, which is similar to the Chaos Heroes transformation in SMT1. And why the fuck do I keep bringing this game up? Jesus Christ. Zelina, on the other hand, I really didn't care for. She's a cool character, but there's a lack of a relationship between her and our pro tag, and the relationship feels more like they're co-workers who talk ever so often, meanwhile Gemini's is almost like your best friend. As for the other characters, a lot of the demon bosses we come across has a lot of personality. It were just an obstacle to us, but someone who was the personification of the themes that the game was talking about. This is especially the case for Mitra, Horikos, and the last three big bosses? Yeah. But Mimelf and Ouroboros probably took the cake for this one, as the two are imposing and made to be really threatening despite their appearance. That could also be the fear talking, but who knows. So, uh, does Strange Journey have any story problems? Like, any at all? Yes? No? It's it's very confusing. Now, as I was playing this game, I was interested to see what was going to happen next and felt like the pace was decent going from one event to the next. Maybe my only complaint is how certain things were required, like for example, finding some form of her jack, which felt like padding, but then again, it's more of a gameplay issue than anything. Hell, now I'm thinking about it, I don't even have any nitpicks to point out because the writing is actually solid. Damn. I'm impressed. So, if there isn't any problems with the story at all, what about the gameplay? And that part, there's a little bit of problems. Okay, so before we get into the nitty gritty of the things that Strange Journey added and also brought back, I want to real quick mention that if you've watched some of the other Mega 10 videos I have created, i.e. the classic mainline games and the Digital Devil Story games, then you likely know all the stuff that's gonna be in this game. If not, and you're new to the channel, first of all, welcome, hello, how are you doing? Um, and also, I will give you guys a very quick rundown of how the system works here. Strange Journey is a first person dozen crawler where the movement for some reason feels slow. Not as bad as, you know, past games, but it's noticeable, especially if you've played something like, I don't know, Soul Hackers, I guess? Uh, anyway, this was made on a modified engine that was used for another Atlas game, Etrian Odyssey, which also had uh, first person dungeon crawling. Everything else is standard in terms of exploration, like the enemy radar, which will tell you when you're close to an encounter. It also doubles as a fear meter because the moment this shit goes red, you better prepare yourself because there is a chance you might get wiped by the random encounters. And I'm not joking about this either. Instead of seeing what enemy you're going to be facing, you'll come across this static little thing that will become the bane of your existence. I don't know if it's because of some psychological shit or what, but if enemies feel like they hit hard and are out for blood in this state. This also applies to every little thing in this game in general, but anyway, after battling them, you'll know what they are, but you won't know some of the other things. So in order to find out their weaknesses and resistances, you need to fill out their analysis part by either fighting them or using them in battle. Now, other than that, a lot of the other standard mechanics in the Mega 10 is here, like Demon Negotiation, which is more streamlined and they actually don't run off of your shit anymore. 
Now, one small addition that's helpful is seeing your condition, which mainly shows how many you know buffs slash debuffs were applied to you or the enemy, and the protections you may have on you. Now, to address the obvious, press turn isn't in this game, and the developers wanted to create a classic Megaton experience. But the system here is like a weird mixture of classic Megaton and the press turn system from Nocturne. Now, before we explain the new gameplay system, um, I think it makes sense to you know talk about alignments because it's actually really important in this game compared to the older games. As in the older titles, you don't really have any benefits of having demons of the same alignment because really the only thing that your alignment kind of affects is which demons you can negotiate with and use. But in Strange Journey, you are rewarded for having teams of demons with the same alignment with the demon co-op system. Was this more press turn than classic Mega 10? But then again, it's, it's a weird mixture. So if you hit an enemy's weakness and someone in your party is of the same alignment, then they can do a follow-up attack. And here's the thing, this shit stacks. So if you have three active party members of the same alignment and you hit the enemy's weakness, then you're going to be doing some good at damage. And one of the most important things about this game is that you need to understand this system. Because if you can exploit it, it makes everything so much easier. And this also includes the Demon Password system. Now this one isn't much more of active gameplay, but more of in a passive sense. You see, you can end up getting some demons from other people with the game, or in this case in 2022 on the internet. And some of the demons in this game can only be unlocked via password. Now, some of these demons can range from, you know, having pretty good stats to being overpowered monsters, like having a new with salvation and a high pixie with all the level 2 magic. Despite how overpowered it may seem, the system manages it by making some of these guys expensive to get through your compendium. Nonetheless, it is a great system which, when utilized, can make your playthrough a lot less stressful. This was actually one of the main reasons I managed to survive this game. And without it, I probably would be crying in the fetal position being stuck on Ouroboros. Instead of going to a Cathedral of Shadows for fusion, you can fuse demons in your Demonica, though the only type of fusion available is a basic fusion which is kind of self-explanatory, two demons, boom, create one. But as you progress through the game, you'll unlock special demons to fuse, which requires around three to five demons to use depending on the demon. Now, remember when I mentioned the analysis bar? Well, after you level a demon analysis bar to level 3, you'll get their demon source, which has moves and other things that can be used to customize demons with some strong ass skills. Long story short, use this shit, be, but be aware that it can only be used once, as you have to be mindful of who you want to give it to. Another thing about this game that you're going to experience is how exploration isn't exactly quick and easy. There are locked doors, hidden doors, and this contraption, with all of these needing to upgrade your demonica to go further. In a way, it feels really similar to Resident Evil with the way you have to go back to certain areas when you have the necessary items. Speaking of which, to push the game's feeling of dread, survival, and hopelessness are Forma, which are materials that can be used to make yourself some weapons, equipments, items, etc. As you progress through the game, you'll come across rare Forma, which can be used to upgrade your Demonica. Some will be given, while others will require you to go out your way to find them. And overall, there are six main apps you will unlock throughout the game. The first is the Unlock app, which can unlock doors according to, uh, the clearance site? Guess to reference something. The second is the gate search app, which can unlock hidden doors that are obscure as fuck and quite frankly is very annoying to deal with. The third is the forma search, which is an app that can help you find different types of forma. The enemy search app, which can be used to find obscure enemies that may provide a challenge or that's just blocking your way. The fifth app is the phase shifter, which can shift you from one dimension to another to unlock hard to reach areas. And finally is the visualizer app, which can actually visualize dark rooms. Oh, and they God, this fucking exists. All of these are important, but you don't need to fully upgrade them to progress through dungeons, unless you're doing the post-game shit. Other than the main apps are sub-apps, which can make your journey easier by either healing you or your party while walking through a dungeon or making fusions and demon negotiations easier. While most of the sub-apps can be unlocked as you progress through the game, the more lucrative ones can be obtained with EX missions. EX missions are side quests that you can accept from demons throughout the game, and most of them require you to either find another demon, bring them an item, fight someone, or do a scavenger hunting shit. 
These pistols are worth it as not only can you get some good sub apps from it, but you can also get really good equipment from them. There were a couple I did, especially towards the end game. In early game, there is an EX mission that will give you a gun that's busted and a sub app called Gibo Eyes, which is important as hell to get. I'm just going to just let that be known right now. Other than that, there are weird changes in this game, most notably how your stats work. So in the other games, you can put your points into your stats after you level up. Though here, your stats grow depending on a growth path you chose from a questionnaire earlier in the game. Now, my best advice is that you should go for magic. Normally in all the other games, you do a strength run or maybe an agility run. No, do magic. Trust me, it will make the adventure less arduous. Another thing is when traveling in any dungeon, you'll come across an abundance of terminals, which can be used to change your sub apps, save, and return to the red sprite, which kind of sucks. It would make dungeon crawling less of a pain if I could travel between one terminal to another. Then again, it probably would be broken. Uh, never mind, never mind, never mind, never mind. There's also a healing spring, which are usually close to a terminal and can be expensive as hell to use, depending on how many party members need healing. Now you can also just always go back to the red sprite to heal, but this little hub area for some reason or another makes you pay to heal yourself. I guess capitalism will follow you everywhere including the shop, where after giving them some format that you collected in the dungeon, they can make your weapons, items, and you know the rest. Now, the major thing that you need to know about this game, and I am going to just, you know, make sure to ram this into your fucking head, is to grind. Because grinding in this game will help you in so many ways. You need some strong weapons and armor? Grind for some forma. You need money? Grind your ass off. Levels? Grind. Because you're gonna need it for everything that'll come ahead. And I'm not joking either, this game is hard. Maybe the hardest game that I've ever played so far. And honestly, my experience with it throughout the whole month of October and early November was nothing but hell. This is one of the reasons why this video took so long to be made. Compared to the other titles so far, this game has 8 dungeons overall, including a small, very small extra dungeon during your time in Sector F. Pretty short for a Megaton game until you learn that they're gonna make you go back and forth through some of these areas. Backtracking is a major part of this game's length and without grinding, it'll be a 25 hour adventure. But not grinding is the equivalent of trying to live with zero kidneys, as the enemies here are going to push your shit in real hard. So with grinding, this will become a 30 hour adventure, even more if you're trying to go higher. And all of this is shown within the first sector of the game. I should already tell you what to expect. Sector A is the first sector you get into, and the early parts aren't that bad. It does a lot to teach you the basics without holding your hand, with the first boss, Orias, being a good test for what you learned so far. Afterwards, the game pats you on the back, tells you good job, then Sparta kicks you into the fiery depths of hell. Going into the lower floors is the true test of this game, where enemies are stronger and you'll likely get curb stumped. As such, you have to grind in order to stand a chance. Oh, and don't think about auto battling either for this entire game. You will die. Now, after all of that, the boss's self tail is not that bad. He is weak to ice, so if you have a couple demons with ice spells, it's time to abuse the demon claw system like a motherfucker. Now, onto Sector B, which introduces the first hazard being damage floors. God damn it! Luckily, they are avoidable, but what's not avoidable is going from point A to B when you get to Mitra's, uh. whatever the fuck this is. This portion of the dungeon is annoying for the content back and forth you gotta go through. Thankfully, the enemies here aren't super annoying, but can inflict some ailments. And will also try to insta-kill you, but as long as you got protection, you'll be fine. Hopefully. The other thing that makes the sector annoying is getting to the boss himself, as you're gonna have to go around the world to get to him, and it'll be a minute, trust me. The boss itself, though, with Demon Co-op is easy if you play aggressively. If you don't, prepare to get hit with either Waking Dream or Light of Order, which I guarantee will be fucking annoying. Sector C is one out of the two or three sectors that is short as hell. The first half of the sector involves you having to find Horikos and shoot him with a gun using the crystal crater from Mistima. It's annoying, but later you do have to find him one last time to go fight him, and that part is pretty easy. He's another easy fight that's weak to fire, so do what you usually do, and if you have a demon that can use any form of debuffs, use it because the battles only get longer from here. On to Sector D, and this sector sucks so much. This is the sector where the backtracking begins. Prepare yourself for the annoyance of moving tiles. 
Yeah! <laughs> After exploring a little bit of the dungeon, we have to go back to Sector B in order to find a way to stop our comrades from killing each other. Through our trek of Mitra's maze of where the fuck, we encounter Mistima, who will ask you a question that can change your alignment. And mind you, this is going to happen a couple more times as you progress through the game, and I forgot to mention too, you also will get alignment questions before you fight the boss. But uh, it, it, they're not too, too important. Anyway, after being directed to the Madman Stone, we put it into the gun we used to beat Horikos and begin treating everyone. And now we gotta fight this little whatever the hell it is and start traveling throughout the whole sector tracking this bitch down. And after killing a couple of them, it brings us back to the fourth floor to fight Asura. Now, Asura is a slight step up in difficulty as he can use a move called Asura Roga, which will be used on the first turn and will cause a member of your party to be enraged. And if it affects the whole party, it won't be a fun time. Other than that, he was another easy one as he barely used it and he's weak to ice, so I co-opt his ass to death. This then takes us to the infamous sector, Iridanus, the hardest dungeon in Megaton. And guess what? This wasn't a hard dungeon to go through. But Carol, there's no way. This dungeon took me hours to do. What about the- Close your mouth. Compared to the other dungeons I have faced, this one is easy as hell. Now, if people were referring to doing the missions Jack's request and or you know the boss fight with Ouroboros, then maybe I can understand. But even then, the teleportation maze isn't bad as long as you have a map with you. Other than that, though, the Jack's request mission it sucks so badly because it's just a boring ass scavenger hunt. Though you want to know what the one thing that made me say fuck this sector? The Ouroboros fight. Oh my god, let's talk about her real quick. Imagine yourself just chilling, going through the game like normal, when all of a sudden someone comes up to you and unleashes the power of the sun on your ass. That's Ouroboros, and she wants you fucking dead. This boss is a wake up call that demands your attention. If you don't give it, you're dead. She has a series of moves that all hurt like hell. There's Wild Thunder, which is a hit all electric spell. Her basic attacks can hit you twice, and there's Disaster Cycle, which will give the user a random status ailment, which will likely be stone. And if you get hit with it and turn to stone, that's game over, Chief. Oh, also, she heals herself at the end of every turn for around 160 to 230 HP. What the fuck? Yeah, this fight is hard, but luckily not impossible, as there is another strat you should know about. Before going into this fight, you ideally need two skills, Lesser Candy and Debilitate, which can raise your stats and lower the enemy stats by one. Use those skills each three times, and only three, because if you go up to four, so you'll use Dekaja or Dekunda depending on which one you got more of. But the only demons with ability at this time is Doth, which if you were grinding means you'll likely have him by now. But what about Lesser Candy? Well, that's where you need to get a Vivian, which is pretty easy to get as well. And when you level her analysis bar up to level 3, you'll get her demon source, which will give you Lester Candy, and you can use that on Doth in some way, shape, or form. Regardless, with all that set, you need to beat her ass for the second form, which will really fuck your ass up. And before the fight, you gotta fight her children so that she doesn't heal every round, and once that's done, do the same strategy as before and be careful or you'll get your shit rocked. Now, set your E was the halfway point, and it's also the point where shit gets even more difficult. I hope you're grinding or you're gonna get fucked up here. This area is kind of like a boss rush, and the bosses range from being really easy to being the equivalent of getting kicked in the balls with the metal shoe from the boondocks. Luckily, the dungeon itself isn't annoying to go through, and after a couple bosses, we gotta go to Jack's HQ, which thank god is a break from the difficulty. All you have to do is just to find Jimenez and then fight Jack, who is so easy, you could, and emphasis on could, auto battle him. But I wouldn't advise it. Why? Because, like I mentioned before, you will die, or in this case, you may die. Anyway, after coming back from his HQ, we gotta fight the last boss before Tiamat, which is Asura. And holy shit, why is he so hard? Asura is a sharp increase in difficulty, and if you thought Ouroboros was bad, just wait till you come to her and get a foot shoved up your ass. She'll use Asura Roga every couple of turns, her physical attacks are really powerful, and she'll go after your healers every time. And she also has a combo with her using charge and a powerful physical attack which can't kill you. As long as you use the Lesser Candy and Debilitate strat that I mentioned earlier, 
you should be fine. Now, this is why I would also say for Tiamat, but nah, this bitch really wants us dead. Tiamat was a really difficult fight, despite having all the necessary stuff ready. She has really strong ice magic, and if you try to use debuffs on her, she'll use a move called Pure Blue to remove all her debuffs and heal herself. Luckily, she doesn't have the Kazumi, you can buff yourself to high hell as much as you want. But as for how to kill her, uh, yeah, you might as well pray, because if this fight took me three tries to beat her, it, it might be the equal amount. Or maybe more, who knows. <laughs> now, Sector G is another short dungeon to an extent, but it, you can also make the argument to ask yourself, what the fuck is this dungeon? Yeah, this sector and the next one is the epitome of constant backtracking, as well as being a preview of the fuck shit you're gonna have to go through for Sector H. Luckily, yes, it is short, but even then, there's so much annoying shit, like having to go through moving tiles, a teleportation maze, and a one-way door maze, which, that in and of itself was freaking annoying, even with a map. They're annoying, but not as annoying as past dungeons, so I'll give it that, I guess. The biggest thing about this dungeon, though, is the boss, which holy shit, is actually easy! Since weak the gun attacks me, if you drop some debility, what's your candy, and manage your healing, then this boss will die to the glorious demon co-op. Thank freaking god! And now, we're at Sector H, the final sector of the game. And it actually technically has two parts to it. Now the first part is where the choices pop up, and depending on your choice, you're gonna have to do different things. Though the most common thing is that you gotta find the cosmic eggs. Now for my playthrough, I was going through the neutral route, which meant I didn't have to fight Commander Gore, who, oh my god, I've heard horror stories about. Now I went straight for the cosmic eggs, which were very easy fights, and then I got to my first roadblock, Zelenin. The fight against her for some reason is difficult as fuck, and she's arguably on pair with Mim Elf in terms of difficulty. Her moves hurt like a bitch, and it's even more annoying dealing with Wave of Death. An all hit physical attack, and Megdio Storm was holy Christ, was annoying. The worst part comes when you get her health low enough, and she'll start spamming Sinner Song. An almighty attack that hurts and has a high chance of charm. Then there is Right Hand, which heals her for over 300 HP and increases all her stats by one tier. Rinse and repeat, and yeah, it took me a while to beat her, and I had to grind my ass off for two fucking hours to even be able to kill her. But once she was dead, I knew right then and there that I needed to grind my ass off if I wanted to get through this game. This led me to a whole day of grinding and doing EX missions. Yeah, it was that serious. Now, the dungeon itself isn't that bad. Time consuming? Yes. But as long as you got a map, you'll be fine. And after going some ways through the sector, we'll have to fight Geminis, who, compared to Zelenin, is sadly very easy to kill. He has some strong skills like Chaos Tech and Dark Matter, but he barely uses the latter, and by the time he gets around to using it, he, he's already dead. Sayonara, my guy. Damn, man. After going through all the phase shifting that made like puzzles of Sector H, now we gotta fight Mim Elf, and I hope you're ready, cause you're gonna die a lot. Now, before we fight Mim Elf, there's a couple things you need to do to prepare for it. And right now, because I don't feel like memorizing this shit, I'm using my phone from the script to go and tell you guys everything. Yeah. It's that serious. So, the first thing you need to do is get demons from a wide variety of alignments. Now, why is this important? Because the second phase... Just know the second phase is going to be annoying, okay? Cool? Cool. Great. The second thing, you need to get some very powerful equipment, meaning a really good sword, some good accessories, equipment, and overall just a really good gun. And the, my best recommendations in terms of accessories and just armor and stuff, Dragon Ring and the Dragon Vest. Now, why the Dragon Ring? Well, long story short, it will save you from death, because you're likely going to die in the middle of these fights. So, if you have that, everything's gonna be Gucci. Trust me. Now, the third thing you need to do is get demons with a wide variety of moves. And what I mean by that, I mean like, really powerful moves. And if possible, try to get demons with like, all four elemental magic. If not, Either get one of like a game facts guide and shit, or do whatever. Do whatever it takes to get all four levels of magic and or demons with really strong skills. Cause trust me, you're gonna fucking need it. And finally, get demons with either salvation, luster candy, or debilitate. If you get all three of those in one demon, that's great. But make sure to get them all. Oh, and especially. Stock up on HP, MP, and Revival Magic 
if possible. Now, the reason why I'm mentioning all of this is that Mem Elf, this bitch will pull all the stops to kill you. And I mean all of them. During her first phase, she has elemental spells that can hit everyone. All the status ailment moves from the past seven bosses, a physical attack that can hit for six to eight times, a move called Reason Start, which removes all buffs and debuffs and heals her for 600 HP, and she has Great Flood, which damages everyone and lowers your agility stats to one. Now, all these moves will quickly kill you if you're not prepared, so the best thing to do is to hit her with all you got, keep watch of your health and make sure not to use all your items because after this is the final phase empty mem elf where yeah she's even more dead set on killing you the final phase gives her three new things to worry about alongside her base moves the first is that she can switch between six random sets of resistances which you won't really know unless you have gibo eyes which can help you figure out which moves to use and not use to make your life easier the second thing is her self-titled move, which will randomly return all demons of a randomly chosen alignment. So, meaning if you have an active party of chaos demons, neutral, raw, then she might get rid of them, and vice versa. Finally, it's MA, the move you need to worry about. This move will insta-kill someone from your active party in hell, even you. If she does this, then she'll heal with your or the demon that they killed with their max HP. Fucked, right? Luckily, if you made it this far, the boss isn't as annoying as her first phase, oddly enough. She has more health, but who cares? Fuck her ass up, watch your health, and once she's dead, enjoy the ending because you just beat the hardest Mega 10 game ever. And honestly, I might need a year or two before I do a second playthrough of this. Now, normally this would be the point where I would just go and talk about my overall opinions on the game, the verdict, and all that other shit, but surprise, surprise, we got one more game to talk about before we get to all of that. Yeah, oh boy. In 2017, SMT celebrated their 25th anniversary, and in March of that year, it was announced that Atlas was going to be remastering Strange Journey for the 3DS. Initially, fans were excited for this game and also slightly worried because of the changes that were being made. And on May 15, 2018, Strange Journey Re does release to critics loving this game and to fans not being fond of it. While keeping the original story the same, Redux added the Atlas classic of remastering games with new content that breaks the difficulty in half and introduces a new storyline featuring a new character named Alex, who is really underbased, man. I wanted to like this game, I really do, but it was so hard to for a lot of reasons that's probably stemmed from burnout and a bunch of other shit, but let's just go down the list of everything this game did before digging into that story. The first change comes from the three new difficulties, Casual, Standard, and Expert. Casual is for those who want to experience the story, and as such you're able to hit like a tank and plow through enemies with little to no issue. Now, you still have to try in the end, but at least you're not being drop kicked 24 7 by everything. Standard is sort of like the original experience, but some of the dings from Casual can still be felt to an extent. Now, Expert Mode is as close as you're going to get from the original during, you know, the first playthrough, because enemies hit a lot harder, ailments are more effective against you, and the damage you deal is slightly lowered, which doesn't make this mode feel hard, but more tedious than anything. And when you beat the game, there's the impossible difficulty, which basically is the original, but amped up to like a hundred or some shit. Besides impossible mode, you can easily switch between the three other difficulties just in case you know you're struggling with a certain boss or whatever. Now for my playthrough, I just went through the game on casual difficulty so I can experience a new story. And with all the other changes, my god is it broken, especially with the new sub apps you can get. There are a bunch of new sub apps and main apps that make both exploration and battles a lot easier. Some of the older ones ended up getting some upgrades like the nurse sub app having an upgrade that will completely mitigate the effects of a damage or the other BS tiles will come across, but the big addition are commander skills. These skills can be used in battle to make things a lot easier. Some are active abilities while others are more passive, and to be honest though, the passive versions are very broken. Despite active aiming randomly, these skills can do things like going before the enemy or using 0 MP for any of your moves. As for the active ones, they can be used in ways to either increase your attack or even crazier, save you from death just in case you fucked up somewhere. Add this in the difficulty of your choice and this game in nature is so much easier as well as being able to run in dungeons now 
fucking finally. Easier difficulty of this game also affects the tone of this game too, unfortunately. The tone from the original had this feeling of dread. It has you feeling you had to be careful because one mishap, just, just one, no matter how big or small, could easily get you killed. But with these new changes, it feels like any other Mega Team game, being that of course you gotta be careful, but it wasn't going to be, you know, a big deal to worry about if you fucked up somewhere. This is also felt in the art style, which feels cleaner compared to the original's, uh, roughness, I guess? I don't know, I just like the original art style a lot better. Speaking of the overall art, and for that matter, the characters, they're fine. It's generic with a shiny coat of paint when it comes to the human characters. They look glossy compared to the original, and this can be seen with the character portraits, which is cool, but it doesn't really add anything to the game. Now, the voice acting is also a ding in this game, but I can't really say much about it because I didn't really care for it. And there's animated cutscenes, which I'll give it to them, they're pretty cool. There's also a major emphasis on blood, which the original didn't have, yet the difference between the two was that, at least in the original, they didn't need blood, because the exaggerated body language shows everything. So yeah, I didn't need this in the blood here, either it just feels worthless, or it's just honestly there for shock factor. Now, if this game had these changes, but still made it difficult like the original, I would be cool with that. But as it is, the remaster feels so much easier, and it's hard for me to be mad at this, especially when thinking about accessibility, as I want to recommend Strange Journey to fans, but that might be pushed away by its difficulty, because it is a really hard game. But the way Atlas did it here feels trivial, not just in the gameplay sense, but I can argue that the feelings from the original are ruined with these changes. And I wish, I just wish that this was all, but then there's the story in the new dungeon. It was, oh Christ, the dungeon was something else. And you know what, at least let me say one thing positive about this game before we continue. Despite the new story not being as fleshed out, I think on paper is a cool idea to revisit how the alignments work after the events of the game and have the means to change it. I might be the only one who dinks this, but you can't deny it would be cool to see the aftermath of an alignment like we saw in ST2. There is a lot of stuff that I want to say about the story overall, but let's first talk about it and then we'll jump into it. But if you guys don't want to be spoiled, make sure to, you know, skip right here. Even then, though, it's really short, so it's, it's really no use to it. Why? You'll see soon. Redux goes through the same set of events from the original, but things begin to change around Sector B. After setting up the final beacon in the sector, we come across a mysterious woman who proceeds to push her shit in and put us six feet under. We get saved by Dimitri, who revived us after our untimely death, and we learn that we're in a mysterious area known as the Womb of Grief an area that's holding demons that were against Mim Elf. While we're getting our bearings straight, Dimitri gives us a rundown of the place and asks us for our help in getting the fruits that's within it. Now, in order to find the fruit Dimitri is looking for, we gotta go down the six different spheres of this area, all the while trying to avoid Alex from killing us again. And really, that's about it, because there isn't really much beyond that. You see, she's made to be seen as a threat to the player and everyone else in the game. But Alex barely pops up in the base story, and this also applies to the Womb of Grief as well. Granted, your tread through the Womb of Grief does let you some little context or overall reveal, and you know what? Let's talk about that real quick. If you manage to get to the final sphere in the dungeon, Alex will tell you to meet with her again once we made her choice. Once that's done, and just as we're about to encounter Memel, we meet with Alex one last time where she explains that she's from the future of whatever alignment we decided to choose, and came to the present to kill us in order to prevent it. Depending on the alignment you choose is what happened in Alex's future. If you chose Law, we find out that Zelina's angelic voice wasn't enough to brainwash everyone, leading to a very, very, very long war. Now, if you chose Chaos, we learn that a world ruled by those who are powerful has practically led Alex into being an orphan and having to fight for her life every day. And if you choose Neutral, humans became so complicit with all the problems that they've caused that the Source Belt ends up returning and destroying the world. Fun, eh? From here, we have a choice on helping Alex to change the future or just to go on Death's ear and, you know, continue towards the older endings. In my case, I wanted to help Alex in changing the future with the resulting decision causing her to fade away back to her quote-unquote new timeline. And after defeating Mem Elf, we encountered Dimitri, who asks for us to give her the eggs and the fruit. We decided not to give it to her, and she steals it, causing us to chase her to the Empyrean Ascent, where there we find the three men that we encountered throughout the game. Furious that we didn't want to create the world to their image, they transform into a giant angelic head and tries to kill us. We managed to defeat them, and with the cosmic eggs, we changed the future of our alignment. Zelda's ending has her using her song to remove the desire for conflict, and as such, she creates a world of peace. 
Gemini's ending has them creating a land where humans and demons can live together and have equal opportunities and freedoms. And finally, it's a neutral ending, the worst one of them all. Acknowledging that the Swords Belt will always come back because of how humans are, the Protag and Otter stays on the moon, and yes, the fucking moon, to protect the Earth whenever the Swords Belt returns. And if you're thinking, oh hey, the Protag is like Doom Guy, exec the freaking Mondo. If you're thinking to yourself that damn, for some new content, this is really short. Yeah, you will be correct. And the crazy part is that Atlas dropped the ball on Alex, who seems like such an interesting character and was fucking promoted like hell, but it felt like she was drawn in there with minimum effort and in integrating her into the overall story. Mind you, this is a common issue with a lot of the Atlas re-releases lately. Some of them were good like Persona 5 Royal, but then you got Catherine Full Body, which is not good either. Oh, and let's bring all of this to the other edition, The Womb of Grief. The best way to describe the Womb of Grief is if Atlas made the Labyrinth of Amala and drew random shit in it just to make it tedious as fuck. This dungeon is easily the worst thing about this game as you'll come across some of, if not the most BS dungeon design since Digital Devil Story. Overall, there are six spheres we gotta go down and if you're going for the new endings, we gotta go through the Empyrean Ascent. And before we start going down the Womb of Grief, we gotta deal with the first spot being the Ingress. Consider this the beginning of hell as it damn near drills everything you're going to encounter throughout this dungeon. It isn't a hard area, but it can be tedious for the amount of gimmicks that's here. Other than that, there isn't really much to say about this floor. The first sphere isn't too bad though, luckily. It's a dungeon full of moving tiles which can be confusing to figure out. Actually, this might be a good time to tell you all to find a map of these floors as well, as it will make things so much easier to get to the box. Another thing to mention is that each sphere has the same enemies from the last dungeon, so for example, the ingress has enemies from sector A and B, and the first sphere has enemies from sector C. Keep that in mind when planning out how to progress. Now eventually we reach the boss Anahita, who's pretty easy and has a weakness of fire. Normally this is where we, you know, we just run it down and kill the boss but at around 40% health, they'll use a desperation move that for the most part makes things quote unquote harder for you. In this case she will block fire attacks for a couple turns but for the most part she's easy. After beating her we end up getting a rare form of which can be used to get some of the commander skills I mentioned before. Now the second sphere compared to the first one is annoying as fuck because of the shit ton of damage and ailment tiles that scattered across the map. In order to survive it you literally need the nurse sub app which may or may not quell the amount of BS in this sphere. The worst part is the pitfalls and with the whole dungeon you need to go the long way to get to the boss room. Long story short, it's gonna be a while until you get out of here, and I hope you have enough uh, medicines, life stones, or healing magic, because it's gonna be very annoying. And the next boss is Ishtar, who is weak to lightning and can become a problem with her alluring squall move that will charm most of your party members. But other than that, keep your health up, and then we can head on to Resident Evil. Oh, wait, wait, sorry, sorry, sorry. I meant to the Dirt Sphere. The Dirt Sphere is basically the Dirt Kalpa from Doctor, and if you guys don't know what the Dirt Kalpa is, well, to make a long story short, we're basically going to be chased by Alex throughout this whole entire floor. Now in order to avoid her, we have to make use of the phase shifter, as she always spawns three tiles away from us and you can luckily see it with the enemy radar. After doing so, we can see her fighting and defeating Amon and now she wants to smoke with us. Similar to the last fight, Alex is weak to lightning magic, but she is way too fast so your moves won't be hitting like that. The best way to counter this is with the Luster Candy slash Debilitate combo, though it's more like you'll be using the Luster Candy because she does have the Kunda Stones. She can also use moves like Evade Physical, which lets her dodge all physical attacks and let her punish you for it with a counter move. Keep that in the combo in mind, and you should be able to defeat her and move on to the next phase of good old hell. So, the earlier spheres, you know, were annoying, but at least manageable. But now we made it to the last three floors, which are all fucking horrible. The fourth sphere in particular is annoying because of the invisible floors you gotta go through, which is nothing but trial and error. There is a sub app to mitigate this shit, but it's all the way in Sector E with us having to do a side quest for Amane Ozume. I hope you did it, or you're gonna suffer like I did. And all of this suffering is met with the easiest boss of this entire dungeon. Fortis, who just like in Nocturne, is a fucking pushover. He's weak to gun damage and it isn't close to being any fucking challenge, so I won't talk much about it. But this isn't where we stop here, as we have a second round against Alex with the same moveset as before, but once he's at low enough health, he'll cover the field and fire, which really doesn't do much, so just beat her and let's move on. 
So, we're close to the end, but we have to deal with the fucking fist sphere, which... Oh my god, this time we gotta deal with the teleportation maze, that is the equivalent of taking the SAT while high off your mind. You would imagine it has a pattern with the flowers on the rocks, but as you progress it feels more random than anything, and you'll be stuck going in circles. Like I mentioned earlier, getting in the map would be a good idea, especially for this fucking sphere. Now before facing the boss, we save Alex and come face to face with Zeus, who has a... very interesting design. Zeus is the boss of this sphere and is weak to win, but this man hits pretty hard with electric and physical attacks. When he is low enough, he'll use Soul Canis, which will nullify all statues of me. At this point, you gotta kill him quick or it's over. And this is actually, I think, the first boss in this whole entire game that actually gave me trouble. Now, after beating him, we follow Alex to the last sphere where we can help her out, but first we gotta get through this fucking six fear of hell. The six fear is an entire puzzle filled area with every ounce of bullshit that you face throughout the whole dungeon. I'm not gonna waste my energy for this one, but just know it'll take you a minute to get through it as you gotta completely upgrade your main apps in order to get through it. Now, the boss for this sphere is a little harder, but then again, it's easier than Zeus, who, like I mentioned before, gave me a little bit of a hard time. Now, Maria is weak to ice and can't kill you with most of her attacks because they're pretty weak. Unfortunately, she'll try to insta-kill your party in order to win, so I hope you have Tetraja or you're going to the afterlife. But after that painful trek through this dungeon, it only gets worse if you go for the new endings where we gotta go through the Empyrean Ascent. So, uh, how is it? Fuck this dungeon! So, peep this right, this dungeon scene is pretty straightforward until you realize you're in another teleportation maze. But each arc that you see has a number of heads that requires you to pass through it in the numerical order to go deeper. Granted, it isn't as bad as the Fist Spear, but it doesn't mean they make it easy for you, as some of the pathways will be blocked by higher numbers, I meaning you gotta go all around the mulberry bush just to get the hell out of there. And once you manage to get you all of that, you still gotta face off between a mid boss, which in my case was Zelenin as a fucking statue, who luckily wasn't that bad compared to the original. But now we gotta fight Shekinah. This boss is more difficult than both of Mem Elf's forms, and she will pull all the stops to kill you. She constantly changes her weaknesses and has moves from all the prior bosses in the womb of grief. And unlike Mim Elf, her first form is pretty easy, and all you gotta do is exploit the weakness and boom, you're done. But Dimitri is called in and using the fruits we collected is a lot tougher and can make you game over if you're not prepared. The main danger is her ability to stop attacks from a particular alignment, so if you've used nothing but chaos demons like I did, she'll constantly reflect those attacks making the fight dead if you have demons from one alignment. The best bet is to get a wide variety of them, and if you're worried about okay, man I won't be able to use the demon co-ops and stuff, don't worry, there is a sub app that will let you use them regardless of alignment. It's a little weaker, but trust me, it's better than nothing. My best advice is prep before fighting her, like prep your ass off, get all the demons, good demons you can get, just all of that shit, cause you'll be stuck for a good hour and a half on this godforsaken fight, and honestly by the time I was done, I just wanted to move on man, just, oh fuck this dungeon. Jesus Christ, okay, look at the obvious out the way. I love Strange Journey a lot. Despite the pain I went through with this game, this has to be among the few that I've played that is my favorite of all time. Everything about it from the atmosphere, music, gameplay, story, everything was just oh, was so damn good. And for the most part, my problems with it are really small compared to Redux, which Damn it, man, I really wanted to like. This game has so much potential, but at the end of the day, a lot of the new additions trivializes a lot of the things from that really made the original so good. Plus, Alice in the Womb of Grief just sucks, man. Not so much of Alex, because honestly, she, she could have just been involved more. It's just, oh, so annoying. But the Womb of Grief, nah, that one can go to hell for all I care. And as for the good old verdict, uh, well, I will say this. Now, I recommend everyone to play this game. Despite Redux feeling inferior to the original, I still think it's a good version to play if you just want to experience it in a more 
basic way. However, if you're feeling up to it, I recommend playing the original first as it is a definitive way of experiencing the story. The only thing you need to prepare for is its difficulty. If you keep that in mind as well as using the guide, map, and taking advantage of everything the game gives you, trust me, your playthrough will be a comfortable one. And with that, thank you guys so much for watching until the end of the video. Jesus Christ, this is gonna be a long one. Oh, fuck me. So yeah, uh, sorry for taking a while for this video to come out. Uh, beyond the external shit that was going on with me, uh, I underestimated the difficulty of this game and I paid for it dearly. <laughs> So yeah, uh, especially right now at the time of this recording too, um, I've been prepping for a mid for finals right now, and uh, that's been fun. So yeah, but uh, it's neither here or there right now. But just know I'm back, and we can hopefully get this next meal out soon. And speaking of which, <laughs> but for real though, next time I see you guys, we will be reviewing SMT4, and yes, we're so close so close until the end of this marathon i already started to play through um at the time of recording this video actually and yeah it's my first playthrough ever uh, a game i really wanted to play when i first got my 3ds which i'll explain more this time thank god <laughs> and uh yeah hopefully it doesn't take me as long i'm hoping it doesn't but we'll see now, like always, make sure to like, comment, subscribe if you guys enjoyed the video. And if you do subscribe, make sure to hit the little notification bell to know when the next video is going to be coming out. And like always, make sure to stay safe, wear a mask when shit's getting crazy out there. And I hope to see you guys in the next video. Peace!